I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're watching The Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today my guest is Sarah Rose Bright. Sarah is the first UK certified sex coach, a true pioneer. Sarah had a successful corporate career but found herself a single parent, terrified of sex, loathing her body and ashamed. Her sexual journey began when she picked up a book on Tantra. Now Sarah works with men and women to empower them to awaken their true sexual nature. Sarah, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. I'm so excited about this interview. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited too. <laughs> Sarah, tell me about your journey. Okay. How did you become a sex coach? Okay, well, it certainly wasn't something that was discussed in the career service <laughs> yeah, at school. I can imagine. <laughs> it wasn't on my radar at all. And people often think that I got into this work because I must be really good at sex. And actually, it was the opposite. So in, by the time I was 29, I hated my body. I was terrified of sex. I didn't know what I wanted sexually, didn't even know how to ask for it if I did. Um, I was really avoiding relationships really unhappy and I just knew I had to do something about it and I started sort of I'd had a lot of trauma in my teenage years as well what sort um, of trauma? I had a relationship in my teenage years which was incredibly emotionally abusive okay. so by the time I finished that wow, relationship when a teenager that's quite that's young to go through that sort of just as my abuse. sexuality was flowering mm. I had a partner who was telling me that just comments about my body and de sort of derogatory comments and some of them very abusive. So by the time I was 18, my self-esteem was just in tatters. Um, and I went off to university, just numbed out in the usual partying way. Didn't really realize I had any pain there. But when I had my daughter, very young, she was the catalyst for things changing in my life. Um, and then I started doing some personal growth sort of work and mm. went to these workshops and things. And bearing in mind, this was over 15 years ago. Yeah, when personal growth was, yeah, just beginning. Exactly. Well, it was, it's been going on a long time, but yeah, I guess it, ha it isn't what it is today. So oh gosh, nowhere near. And I just noticed everything was talked about this word sex. It was just missing from the hey. agenda. But I just knew I had to do something about it. Um, and because I had a good corporate career at the time, I was flying in the corporate world. Mm. Um, and yet inside I was just unhappy and I was just numbing out through, I was drinking, you know, every day pretty much and just unhappy in every level, but outwardly looked great, looked like mm. I was successful, had a lovely company car, all those trappings, but I was inside just dying and I just knew I had to do something about it. And two, there was a couple of things that happened. One, I remember looking in the back of Cosmopolitan and I heard about labiaplasty, mm. which is where women have their, their, their labias um, reshaped or trimmed to look better. Which is actually a really popular very operation popular. these days. Yeah, very popular. Um, you know, obviously we've all heard about the boob job and that's yep. quite, uh, that's obviously been going for years. Yep. But this whole sort of vaginal reconstruction yep. um, has become... I mean, certainly something that I'm seeing more and more sure. about. But, um, yeah. Absolutely, it's massively grown. And I just thought, I, I thought, well, maybe this is the solution because I thought my genitals were deformed. I thought they were just disgusting from what the experience that I've had. And that affected me. I couldn't, there was no way I was going to open up and relax in the bedroom if I felt that. Of course. Um, and then I had this thought one day, I just thought, if this is it for sex and relationships, just take me now. And, and in that moment was actually a wake up of, this is really bad, I've got to do something about it. And I was 29, so when you, know, when you approach big birthdays, often you reflect on what's yeah, happened completely. in your life. And I knew I didn't want to go to a therapist, I knew I didn't want to go to a doctor because I didn't have any medical problems, but there was nowhere else to go. Was there a reason why you didn't want to go to a therapist, or I mean a doctor, I guess there was, there was nothing wrong exactly. with you. Exactly. Um, a therapist just felt too, sort of very serious, serious. And, and, and I just didn't feel right for me, I just no. intuitively just knew that. Mm -hmm. But there was no sex coaches then, literally, um, I'd, I'd never heard of that as a possibility. So I went to Waterstones um, in Liverpool and I was browsing the book section and I found this book on Tantra. And I picked this book up and something just made sense. I just knew there was something in this book for me. However, it didn't, I didn't understand it. I knew I had to go and experience it. And this was again in the early days of the internet. So I'm searching online and found there was a women's tantra workshop in Lancashire, of all places. Wow. <laughs> um, six weeks later, just after my 30th birthday, so I booked myself on this workshop. 
Um, I didn't pay my money till the day before. I literally parked my car where I was facing the, the, the gate if I needed to get away quickly because I felt that much fear to look at this area of my life. But just something got me there. And that first night just utterly blew my life totally wide open. Tell me about that. I mean, because the, the word Tantra, yep. um, you know, if I think about Tantra a few years ago, Sting, I think, sort yeah. of brought it all alive, you know, yep. in, in the 80s. It was that whole Tantra. Was it the 90s? I don't know. I can't remember. But yeah, in, in, what, what exactly is Tantra for people that don't know out there? So Tantra, so I guess this Tantra in the, in the UK and in the Western world is a sort of a hybrid of, of, of the Eastern Tantra. It's more designed for mm. sort of, they call it Neo Tantra. Um, and Tantra is, it means lots of different things to lots of different people. But in essence, to me, it means bringing the heart and the spirit into our sexual lives. Because often sex is just about sex. And there's nothing wrong with that. It can mm. be absolutely physical. great. Yeah, yeah. very mm. physical. Um, but bringing in the heart and the spiritual dimensions um, changes everything. Um, and it's just a it's it, the word tantra means to sort of weave and expand okay. so as we become more comfortable with ourselves because tantra sexuality is actually a very small part of the tantric path mm. tantra is a way of life so there's a wonderful phrase by a woman called margot anand and she said tantra is to live every moment orgasmically that our wow. senses are so alive and awake and we're so present that a conversation can be orgasmic, that watching the sunset can yeah, be orgasmic, right. eating a pear. It's that sense of aliveness. Yeah. And if we bring that into the bedroom, wow, well, that's a whole different kettle of fish than, than, than how we often show up. <laughs> and how do you, I mean, how do you, I guess, how do you practice, how do you, how do you practice that tantra being, bringing in the, uh, let's say, obviously, sex to, to I, I want to say most people, but I don't want to generalise, mm -hmm is a very physical act mm -hmm. um, but how how are you bringing in those emotions um, and that heartfelt experience you said to be absolutely present which I absolutely agree mm. um, over the past year I've I've been doing everything in my life it's all about being present mm -hmm. now and much more heart-centered and it makes a complete difference if you're not in your mind and running yep. away in the future or in the past and just being totally focused and yep. present but how do you take that in, into sex so I talk about um, the performance to pleasure model so often the main way that we learn sex is very goal orientated yes. so if you look at sex yes. in the movies the couple will come together and ripping each other's clothes off penetration within seconds if it's a heterosexual relationship yeah. and the goal is having orgasms ideally at the same time yeah does that, I mean how often does that really happen exactly. is that really a reality <laughs> exactly because that's but that's what people strive for and somehow, if they don't reach that, they feel like they've somehow failed mm. and it's not been successful sex. If we put the goal to pleasure, not to orgasms, if we have the goal of pleasure, it's a very different experience. So when our goal is pleasure, it doesn't matter if it's big pleasure or little pleasure. We're just fully, because if we're looking at the goal, we're always having one eye out of the direct experience. Yeah. We're not fully present because when we're, how do I, how, how do I, how do I turn them on more? How do I feel more turned on? I'm not turned on enough. We get into performance anxiety, inner dialogue. And you get into your head, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, Whereas if we just be thinking, yeah, am I doing the right thing? Is he enjoying it? Am I enjoying it? You know, yep. I, I'm not orgasming, yep. orgasming now. Oh my God, he's going to feel awful. What yep. do I do? I'm yep. sorry, this is just my own experience. <laughs> um, but those, they're common inner dialogues that we have. Whereas the pleasure model is about being so present, using things like the breath, sound because in our goal model of sex we often are tense in the bodies so you know the typical ah, 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 shallow breath everything tenses up but that changes the physiology of our body it affects everything whereas if we're relaxed if our nervous system's calm we're going to be more present if we're breathing more fully and deeply you know we can't shallow breathe and be present at the same time yeah so it's a whole set of behaviours, breath, sound, movement are really key. And also where we place our attention. We're so full of distractions and our, if our attention's on our head, whether it be worrying about what's happening or how do I get to a certain destination, then our head's full of, full of conversations. So how do we really relax and tune into what our bodies are guiding us and telling us, or what our hearts are guiding us and telling us? That experience has changed phenomenally when we do that. But it's a practice. It's not okay. something that's going to happen overnight for most people um, because we're so wired, even in our culture, about doing and, and being. Um, you know, so I encourage people to explore what's it like to slow down during sex, that it's okay to pause and go, what next, rather than just push through. Don't you think sometimes... Um that pause yep. 
uh, especially if you're really in the moment, you think, my God, if I pause now, something's going to happen. It's going to put somebody, you know, maybe if they're just about to climax or whatever, it's going to, that pause might stop it happening. And you're, <laughs> as you say, you're all in that sort of in your head rather yeah. than being in your heart. Can Absolutely. The, can the pause? Obviously, help? yeah. If you're right at that peak point, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it may have an impact. But what people tell me often is they've never considered pausing because they thought pausing, if the arousal drops, that's it. Um, and yes, especially yeah, yeah. Uh, with men around erections, the, the, the arousal drops, then they can go into panic because they, they start to, the erection might start to change. But mm. erections naturally ebb and flow. You know, this image that they should be hard continually puts so much pressure on men. And actually our pleasure is meant to ebb and flow. And if we allow the ebbs and flows, it's a very different experience because we can open out to more full body pleasure. When we have the sort of, if we try and push our pleasure all the time and keep it rising, that's when we tense our bodies and it stops the arousal spreading. How do you stop that tense moment? Because, you know, I'm, I'm not <laughs> thinking about <laughs> to, But th there is, I, I know, I, you, you tense your body. Yep. Obviously, yeah, I'm not the only one, you yeah. do tense your body. How do you actually stop that tense? So it's not about okay. stopping it totally, because if something really pleasurable happens, the natural thing is, ah, oh, to tense the body, because it feels good. Yeah. However, what we often do is we tense the body and we stay there. And if we, and then it builds more and more tension. Whereas if we just tense the body when it feels good and then take a deep breath and let go, and then the pleasure can flow more through the body, then it tenses again and then we let go. So it's more that sort of allowing it to ebb and flow. But majority of people I work with have some sort of regular tension holding pattern in their bodies. So, for example, when they're thrusting, their buttocks are always tense mm. and they just don't let them go. Or their jaws might be tense because they don't want to, they, they may be not used to making noise. Often we learn sex through masturbation and we learn to do it quickly and quietly because we don't want to get <laughs> caught. You don't want anyone to yeah, hear you. <laughs> but when we learn to do it quickly and quietly, we're more likely to be rigid and tense and have our mouths clam shut. Mm. So encouraging people to relax, relax their jaws, open their mouths, breathe deeply, soften, move their bodies, follow the natural impulses of their bodies rather than tensing and holding rigid. So it's a lot about noticing what you're doing. And, 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 men, and uh, many of my clients go, well, if I relax and let go, surely... I'm going to ejaculate quickly or these different fears come up. But actually, it's the opposite is true, that when you do that, we can actually experience more pleasure the more relaxed we are. Wow. And, and being more relaxed has a massive impact on our, um, you know, it's going to be difficult to orgasm, difficult to um, last longer if we're tense and holding on to it. Um, and for a man going back, and I'm, I'm going to touch on this subject because um, there may be men watching this. Uh, I'm sure there is. Uh, <laughs> If, if, if a man does lose his erection during sex, yep. what is, is there a way that you can get that back? Uh, absolutely. There... And, and it, the, obviously, there could be lots of different reasons. So, for example, if a man's losing his erection because he's just very, very stressed and low energy, or there's a problem, it's a reflection of a problem in the relationship, mm. there can be lots of different reasons. However, in the main, when a man loses his erection, he, the first thing he does is panic. Because the fear of what that means, um, often men have had cases where they've lost the erections and the woman has thought it's because they don't fancy them or don't well, desire them. Well, that's your first thing, isn't it? As a woman, you're like, God, it must be my body or, I, or they don't fancy me or they're just not into me, which is ridiculous. In, right? It's ridiculous, nothing especially is if you're at that stage. I, I, I'm nothing is worse than truth. And the men, man's there thinking, oh my God, I'm adoring her and my body's doing this, yeah. you know? And so um, the first thing to do is just not panic. Because if you go into panic and stress, it's going to be even harder, excuse the pun, for it, <laughs> for it to change. Yes. So the best thing is just to relax and just go in and do something different. Go and enjoy the pleasure that's there. Our, our sort of pleasure is so linear that it has to be penetrations like the ultimate four players, the sort of the little sort of um, cousin to this amazing feast. But actually, it's all amazing if we take it away from that linear model. And so it just go back and just relax and enjoy. And often just doing that, the pleasure can rise up again. Um, but what happens so commonly for men is they just shut down because they're just scared or they feel there's something wrong with them. What will the woman think of them? All the stories we get into. Yeah, but it's very natural that erections ebb and flow. Okay, that's good to mm. know. I do want to talk about the women's orgasm yep. that obviously has been talked about for, <clears throat> well, through the centuries, obviously. Yep. Um, and... Do, do we put too much focus on it? 
I mean, certainly when I was um, growing up, not growing up, when I was going through different stages of my life, I think in my 20s, I wasn't even, I didn't even think about it. To be honest, it's sex for sex. It was yep. very much okay. a physical activity. Um, and it wasn't until I got to my 30s, um, I had a not, a, not a similar experience to yourself, but I hadn't had an orgasm. And I don't think this is uncommon for mm -hmm. women in their early 30s. And I remember I did go to a therapist because I was in a long-term partnership. Mm -hmm. I was with, with a guy for 10 years. Um, and we were, we were talking about sex yep. and, you know, why I hadn't had an orgasm and all the rest of it. And she gave me a book and she said, read this, mm -hmm. How to Have an Orgasm. And ever since that day, I read the book. Um, and, yeah, I've, I've had orgasms ever since. Yep. But I didn't, I was so not in touch with my body in yeah. my 20s compared to where, certainly where I am today. And the 30s for me was almost like exploration decade. Yep. My 40s now is like, sex is fucking amazing. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, welcome, bring on the 50s. Yeah. Do you think it changes with women and in, 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 in growing and, and growing older and maybe becoming more com com comfortable in their bodies? Absolutely. I mean, I regularly meet women that are having the best sex of their lives in the 40s and the 50s, for sure. However, there's also some women where it changes at menopause. And because things change in our bodies so much, sex can feel like it shuts down and they don't pick it up again. And, you know, it's such a myth that as women, as we get older, our bodies are just going to sort of, you know, the, the, the image of the vagina shriveling up and drying up and then there's no sex. Yeah. It's really actually strong. I'm working with a woman at the moment. She realised that was a belief she was carrying about herself for menopause. And that now, she thought that literally the, the, literally, the, the yeah. vagina would, would shrivel. And, and also that she was not of a value as a sexual being. Now she was of that yeah. age. Yeah. And so she's just totally rewriting the beliefs. And, you know, because I think there's more and more women doing that. But I think women have different social messages. We, you know, uh, we're not raised to love our bodies and our sexuality. No, not at all. And often, so many women I work with are people pleasers when it comes to pleasure. Their pleasure, they, it's about the other person. They don't know much about how their bodies work. They don't know what their desires are, and they don't know how to ask for them. Um, and when I first realized that in myself, I was in my early 30s. I mean, I can remember sobbing, going, I don't know what I want. And I can't believe I've got to this age and not know. Um, but then it was amazing because it was like, right, I'm going to find out and not waste any time. But I think we've got the orgasm gap where women do orgasm significantly less than men. And I think that sort of people pleasing and not knowing our, what our pleasure is and how it works is a really big part of that. And also the type of sex that we have. You know, 70% of women don't orgasm through penetrative sex. 70%. Around and 70. <clears throat> yeah. I find that really interesting mm -hmm. because I think we're led to believe, again, from the movies and porn and magazines that you, you should orgasm as, exactly at the same time as your partner. Yeah. And it's through penetrative sex. Yep. Uh, but 70% can't, yes, don't, don't, don't. But I, Is it a don't or a can't? I think it's a don't because, two reasons... Women are not, a lot of women don't have much sensation inside their vaginal canal for, for the reason that they just don't have a relationship with that part of their body because it's inside. Yes. Yeah. So, well, you know, what we're used to doing is, is putting a tampax up there, I guess, is, is more often or than washing. Not. You know, we have yeah, this area of our body, we tend to have a sexual relationship, medical relationship, hygiene relationship. That's it, you know. So, we don't actually know it very well. So, often women are numb inside of there, all the other extreme pain. If we're numb and we don't have any sensation in there, which is really common, that's really going to affect our ability to orgasm through penetration. And also the type of sex that we have, when it's sort of the tendency for the model is to be sort of hard, get harder and faster. Yes. But as the, the, the cock is going in, out, in, out, it's yeah. not massaging the vaginal canal and enhancing sensation. There's nothing wrong with it. It can feel great. But I think if we learn to slow down and have a different type of sex as well as the faster sex, that enhances the sensation that's available in terms of inside the vaginal canal. Um, so I think once woman starts to increase sensation, try different ways of having sex, um, I've seen many women start to, to orgasm through penetration. Wow, that's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> good news, hey? Yeah, good news, great, <laughs> yes. Um, and we were talking earlier, um, I mean, I mean ab about that subject, about vaginas, yep. you know, and the fact that uh, very different to the men's genitals, to the penis, where they're outside. Women don't, I mean, 
it's one of those areas of the body or is the area of the body where I guess most women just don't even look at. I mean, I certainly don't really spend much attention at mine, looking at mine. Yep. Um, and it's, yeah, so it, is that is that normal? Is it, should we know what our vaginas look like? Like boobs, yep. we're all different, yep. right? Like, like cocks, they're yep. all different. Um, but for some reason, I guess we have it in our head that they all should be this like perfectly formed, um, asymmetrical v-shape absolutely uh, with or without hair now it's without hair it used to be in the 70s with yep. hair whatever yeah but... yeah no absolutely and i think you know our vaginas are as different as our faces there's such a massive range i, I i'm really dying to ask this question okay. and it's probably what everyone you know wants to ask what makes mind-blowing sex is there any <laughs> key tips <laughs> than what you already asked you know is there a secret source or is it just about two people and like you say being centered and in your heart there's that there's the obviously a chemistry part of it as well mm. and i think what makes mind-blowing sex is self-defined because what makes mind-blowing sex for one person yeah. might be a real turn off for another you know and I, but i think part of it is is what makes mind-blowing sex is really owning what lights us up and what we desire yeah. and voicing that and creating that because if we're trying to do sex because we think this is how we should do it we're not going to be enjoying it we're going to be putting a role on, putting a mask yeah. on. Yes. And so it's about really finding what feels true for you and then, but also about really bringing the body in, you know, because our body is just full of infinite pleasure. And I sort of talk about our pleasure capacity. So if you look at it in terms of broadband, we used to have like 10 <laughs> megabits, right? Yeah. Most of us are experiencing pleasure in 10 megabits. I love it. But yeah. the more we relax, the more we get to know our bodies, enjoy them, we start to experience more and more pleasure. And now we've got infinite broadband. And I totally believe Whoa, there's infinite I love pleasure. That. Yeah, you know? that's great. There's always places to go. If you're learning a sport, learning a musical instrument, there's always new depths to take it to. And it's exactly the same with our bodies and our pleasure. You know, great sex doesn't necessarily mean more and more outward adventures. It's actually also about what we can achieve and what we can experience within. And do you think it's about being with the same partner? Obviously, relationships have definitely changed over the yep. last 20, 30 years. You know, we, uh, in, back in the good old days, we were with one person for the rest of our lives and married yep. and we might be having affairs. That these days, we, we're, we're probably not getting as married as much as we used to. Yep. There's obviously a lot of divorces out there. But there's also polyamory. Yep. Uh, there's people with open relationships. Yep. There's gay relationships, straight relationships, you name yep. it, relationships. Yep. Has that, has that changed things? Do you think you need to be with one person to get used to sort of sex with that person to make it fantastic? I think it's a really personal choice. Relationships are at the more open they have been than in, 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 you know, in, in history. This last sort of 30 years, what's opened up in terms of choices. And so there is a growth in polyamory relationships, open relationships, but all these different relationships models. And I think it's what works for you. I think the myth that being in a long-term relationship means the end to your sex life yeah. is not true. Um, it certainly can. Oh, hey, you're married. <laughs> you won't be having sex. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, you know, having a great sex life over a long term takes commitment. You know, it's like, it's like tending and making a garden beautiful. It takes time, commitment and learning and communication and time to practice and explore and get to know each other because we're always changing. But I think it's absolutely possible. Um, and then there's also, like you say, open relationships and things. So it's a really personal choice. And what's wonderful is there is so much choice nowadays. Um, and, you know, a valid choice can be being single and people having lovers. And, and also you can have great sex on your own. You know, I think people sort of see sex by themselves as something that's less than or something you do when you don't have a partner. Yeah. But actually it's something that's totally different. Um, and that can be an incredible practice to, to learn about yourself and to keep your sexuality buoyant and alive. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> Um, sexual confidence, yep. does that lead to, how, how can that help improve your life in general? Well, I love the phrase, is it um, T. Harvey Ecker, the mm. quite famous guy, who says, how you are in anything is how you are in everything. Um, and so when we're not confident in the bedroom, when we're having sexual problems, that absolutely ripples out into every aspect of our lives. However, when we empower ourselves in this area of our lives, when we face problems that we may be having, where we learn about our bodies and our pleasure and increase our sexual confidence, that ripples out into every aspect of our lives as well. So I've seen people who have really empowered themselves sexually, have go on to take, um, have um, shift their whole relationships, become more healthier and happier and kinder. Mm. 
um, take risks in business, set businesses up, start creative pursuits. You know, I've seen this confidence ripple out. Uh, I've had clients who it's helped them with their public speaking. You know, it's helped in so many different aspects because part of it is the tools that they've learned, things like, for example, just things like breathing. I know it sounds so simple, but we're poor in terms of how we breathe. We shallow breathe a lot. So just learning how to fully breathe yeah, can completely. change somebody's confidence. Um, so absolutely, when we're sexually confident, you know when, well, uh, Napoleon Hill, we were talking earlier. Yes. The guy who wrote Think and Grow Rich, yes. I think, in the 20s. Yeah, it was, yeah the 30s, I think. Yeah, 30s, yeah. yeah. And he, he, in that book, I think it's chapter 12, he talks about sex transmutation. Sweet transmutation, Which yeah. is l using our sexual energy to um, manifest and create in our lives. You know, our sexual energy, at its essence, can create another human being. So if we're not using it to create human beings, we can use it to create projects. We can use it to create more businesses, of ourselves. Businesses, absolutely, change the world. In. You know, and and geniuses. Uh, so uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I think in the research he did shows that they were having good, healthy libidos and sex lives. And, and, and at the time, he was very focused on men because it was back yep. in the, 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 thir the 30s, I think. But it was all about behind every great man, he needs to be having good sex yep. to be creative and to be getting out there and, and to be being amazing behind yep. every... A uh, great man, there is a great woman. Now, of course, I wouldn't, you know, nowadays you could reverse that Absolutely. as well as both sides. Yeah. But then he was talking about every successful man has a successful woman yep. behind him that he's basically, I don't want to use the word shining, but <laughs> making love with yep. and having great sex with yep. because that is part of it. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what the Taoists and the Tantricas have known for centuries is our sexual energy is not our power source. It's our life force. You know, when somebody walks in the room, and they've just got that incredible radiance. It doesn't matter how old they are, how they look or anything. They've just got something about them I that's magnetizing. And I totally believe that our sexual energy is that power source. So actually we could turn this tips to be successful, have great sex. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Sarah, unfortunately, we're coming to, <laughs> towards the end of the interview. And I honestly could chat about this for absolutely ages. It's the classic, let's talk about sex, yep. baby. <laughs> um, where can people find out about you? And um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about what you're doing in business. And um, Yeah. So, well, my website is sarahrosebright.com. So please feel free to visit me there. Sign up to my newsletter. So I send out monthly practices. So just little practices that can help us to connect to our sexuality on a day-to-day -day basis um, in our lives in the bedroom. I'm also on Instagram, Sarah Rose Bright, Facebook, Sarah Rose Bright Sex Coach. And I'm just starting some stuff on YouTube with Sarah Rose Bright as well. Great, and we'll put all that in the show notes. Amazing. And also just to say, so I work with, you know, uh, with, with women, couples. I do one-to-one -one work, retreats, online courses, a whole host of things. But I just really want to say, you know, whether you contact me or somebody else, if you've got some sexual problems, you can often feel totally alone with it. Yeah, you can feel shame, you can feel a lot of stigma, fear, all sorts of different things. But I promise you that the hardest step is often the first step um, because we're so, um, you know, it, it brings up so much. But getting some support, it might be just braving a conversation with a loved one mm. or a friend, but getting some support from somebody like myself can absolutely take you there quicker, faster, easier, and a lot more fun than on your own. So I just really say that this, this area of your life, you know, to embrace it because it so can important. change everything is so it's important. So important. Yeah. Passion is, you know, it's what we're here to live yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> Joy and experience. Um, and now to my final question. Yeah. If you were to write a message in a bottle for future generations to find, what would that message be? <laughs> well, you, you, in the question you asked about maybe like 50 years, and I was thinking, well, wow, what, what are the people going to be like in 50, 50 years, years that pick this message up, you know, because with it, the way the world's going, it could be so many things. So I just thought really in essence that your sexuality is your power source because that might be something that's not even talked about. Who knows? It, it might be something that's very familiar, but I just think that popping that bit of ancient wisdom 50 years forward, um, that's, that's the message I I'd love certainly it. Your carry. sexuality is your power force. Yep. Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> having you, you so on my much. show. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you for having me. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday, so hit subscribe and like and you'll get it straight into your inbox.